today we're going to be talking about implementing quality agreements, and I appreciate y'all's attendance. Okay, so let's go through the learning objectives for today. So obviously we're going to define the purpose of a quality agreement, and we're going to be reaching back into the GMP world for that one. We'll look at the differences between a quality agreement and a contract for services. And when I'm talking about a contract for services, I'm talking about clinical services, right? We're going to identify the critical factors that need to be addressed so that you can have an effective quality agreement. And then we'll look at how to evaluate, determine who's responsible for those quality agreements, determine who's responsible for enforcing those quality agreements. And then strategies for managing reticence from vendors about quality agreements. And this does come up. So we'll discuss some strategies, some whys and some strategies. And then we're going to look at determining when quality agreements should be developed and agreed upon. And then to explore the possible content of quality agreements. So what is it? Well, it's a formal agreement, it's documented and agreed upon between your company and your vendors or contractors in the clinical space. And it details the prevailing, it was, I use that word intently, prevailing because they do change, the regulatory standards, the GCP responsibilities, which I don't know if you're aware, R3 is under discussion at this point, ICHE 6 R3 and includes quality measures for each party, the sponsor and the contractor. It describes the scope of what those quality oversight activities might be. And here's something really important to take away. It is QA to QA. So clinical QA to clinical QA. And the term quality agreement is borrowed from the GMP world in ICHQ7. So why do we need them? Well, they provide a quality framework for services. And what the quality agreement does is confirm that there's effective communication and escalation processes in place that would allow optimal and immediate sharing of information between your vendors, QA, and your QA. And as I said previously, it describes the standards, expectations, responsibilities, and working relationships between the vendor, so that would be the scope, e.g. clinical, quality assurance, so the, the vendor's CQA, and I'm just gonna start shortening it to that because it's a lot to say, CQA function, and the sponsor, your, function, clinical CRO, early clinical development, QA, whichever they are responding to. And then the services that the vendor will provide for your clinical trials. The quality agreement is in addition to any project specific communication plans that are in effect, as well as any existing master contract or master service agreement. And in the event that there's a conflict between those existing contracts and agreements, that quality agreement states which agreement will control the process. All right, so how is that accomplished? It's the quality agreement outlines the processes that the parties will use to confirm the alignment with all these various regs national, local, regional, et cetera, that are imposed on the clinical trials that we run, SOPs that will be used to confirm alignments. And as you'll see, we'll get further along, that may be a combination of both, one or the other, or a hybrid SOP is created. We'll get to that. And it outlines the quality processes that'll manage communication, escalation, reporting of procedures, for quality and compliance issues. I've already touched on. 